Hosting a show about crime has taken me to a lot of places, including some you might want to avoid. Sean Larkin here for Crime in Place, the iPhone app that reports FBI crime rates for any spot in the country. Just put in a location and the type of crime you're concerned with. Instantly, you'll know where you stand or where you don't want to. Do yourself and your family a favor. Go to CrimeInPlace.com for your free download of Crime in Place. Stay aware, stay safe with Crime in Place. Howard Doss. Mr. Lockan. Man, we have got a guy in studio with us here today. Yeah, we don't get to usually have people in the studio. We like that. Well, we have Jason every week. Yeah, but we we see him a lot outside of the studio. So He's pretty important. He's not, he's not special. I mean, he is special, but... He is, but he has a, he he puts in a lot of work in Tulsa. Jason does, but he has not put in the type of work that uh, that our guest here has. Um, all of our listeners and and those that are watching this on YouTube uh, may recognize the name, may recognize the face. Um, he was a regular on the television show The First Forty Eight, which has been on TV for damn near forty eight years. It seems like it's been on for a very very long time, and. Here in the city of Tulsa, they have been featured on it a very long time because, uh, I mean, not to brag, but they have a very, very good homicide unit. Solves a lot of their crimes. And we have got their former supervisor, who is now retired, Dave Walker, here with us today. Hey, Dave. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, Dave, so this is a uh, podcast that goes by the name of Cocktails and Cocktails. Um so obviously we're going to have some great stories and conversation with yourself, but Howard and I have to have a drink. It's um, mandatory. It's mandatory. It's part of our contract. Like they'll shut down Spotify, yeah. you know, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and all these things if right. we don't it's, do this. It's so, in the bylaws. I understand that there are things you just got to do. Just, just got to. So unfortunately, we have to do that. But what are we going to drink tonight, Sean? Man, we are going to drink actually a relatively cheap, cheap, cheap bottle. I mean, this is like twenty, twenty-five bucks. Uh, it's a very old one that kind of came back um, called Old Tub. And I think when it came out, you actually went out and bought like a case of these or something. I did. It's I remember. Pretty, it doesn't taste too bad. No, it doesn't. Much. It doesn't. Since we've got an old school retired cop here, we're going to drink some Old Tub. And Dave, what are you drinking? Tell everybody what you're drinking today. Uh, I'm not drinking any of the Old Tub. <laughs> Why not, sir? It's because I'll end up sleeping in the Old Tub. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> I've done that before. That's why I got a job. <laughs> So Dave is having ice water here with us today. Well, Dave, oh, we hear lots of people world. talking about First 48, you know. I mean, it, it was the really the – it was the television show that set Tulsa on the map, you know. It was the original television show that set Tulsa on the map. I mean, well, I think there was one other that was featured in Tulsa. I think it was on some – network i can't remember the name of the network but it had like police officers being followed but 48 was the real one right right yeah i mean i, I actually remember the first 48 being uh being here when when that other show yeah that went around with that other guy that, that bounced around every now and what then. show are you guys talking about i don't know it was some show what they did was they followed police around with cameras and but they were doing it live like it was a sporting event oh that was the one that followed around the good looking cops in tulsa that's the one you're talking about, like live. No, they followed around Chad Ayers, which that, <laughs> that really throws that out of sync there. <laughs> so, yeah, we're real fortunate to have a – our police force, part of the reason the homicides are uh, featured in Tulsa is because you guys have a lot of them, correct? We, we, well, <laughs> yes, we, ha we have enough to, to, to make the show. Um, but, but more than that, we, we solve a lot of them. So that, they don't put the ones on there very often that – that are still open. So yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. I mean, in, like I said, Dave, how many years were you? Uh, first of all, how long were you on the police department? When did you come on? And I came on in '82. Eighty two. A, a different era. That was a very different era. So uh, yeah, '82. I uh, graduated from college December '81, and, and they offered me a job January '82. And like I said, I didn't want to, tired of being drunk and stupid, and and then I was employed stupid. So <laughs> uh, they couldn't get rid of me. So I was there for 36 years, retired uh, August of 2018. 36 years. That's a ton, man. That's a long yeah. time. So I, I was telling Jason there that uh, I didn't wake up until 33 years into it. I mean, it was one of those those jobs, that, and Sean, you, you, you know that. It's one of those jobs where you just kind of roll with it and have a lot of fun with it. And then all of a sudden I woke up and just said, wow, I'm a little bit tired of it. And, mm -hmm. and so you lasted a third, three more years in the homicide unit until you can get to a spot where it was time to, 
to walk out the door and uh, I got that spot man for your career coming on in 82 obviously a a shitload of changes in law enforcement and you know through the years everything from technology to policies you know case law that happens and so forth from the time you started until you left what was one of the biggest things that you think was uh you know just one of those huge changes that happened to the profession with your time in it well i think uh, when when we talk start talking about my rookie time uh, when i saw a canine officer uh, take a shot at a burglar from about 300 yards uh, that was kind of like eye-opening to me and the kid, the kid dropped and, and fortunately i'm from st louis and never really fired a gun i thought damn that, that's a good shot <laughs> <laughs> i would say uh, but so then the, then those laws came out that we couldn't shoot fleeing felons so you saw all the old heads were saying well we can't do police work right so uh, that that changed just a little bit in how we approach things but i think technology is uh Gosh, the way the cops work is the computer. Uh, just so quickly we can get, uh, you know, technology and the intelligence on, on somebody. And you and I talked on, mm-hmm. on, on murder suspects, and uh, we can just get it out there and get it to the folks. And, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why crime gets solved uh, so quickly now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and throughout your career, obviously you start out in patrol. I, I know the latter part of your career you were this – amazing robbery supervisor then homicide became available you moved over there and established yourself there what about the rest of your career what else you do yeah, i started uh the first thing was 82 in patrol obviously uh spent seven years there got promoted to sergeant pretty quick um uh, and, and quickly hit that that ceiling where i couldn't go any higher yeah I, not that i really wanted to but uh, they they had the opportunity to promote me and they didn't and that's probably the best thing for us. But then, uh, 89, <laughs> I went undercover for 10 years at SID. Uh, got booted out of there after a while and, and went uh, and got angry and went to internal affairs for one year. Oh. Uh, so I put myself in prison, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and and you became me and the a social chief. pariah. Huh? <laughs> well, I didn't last long enough to, to even make a dent there. The, the chief came to me and said, you're not in a good spot. And I agreed. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then I went uh, to burglary from there, and, and that was probably the best spot ever. I mean, you chase kids around, you jump fences, you tackle them, you, you well, you, you can't do any much more to them. But you handcuff them, bring them back downtown, and you cuff them, and they're back out again. So, you, heck, we know who they are. You, you know their run. Mm-hmm. So when you're chasing them next week, uh, you, you'll just say, hey, come here, Jimmy. Uh, you're, you're caught. And then, but. The big deal is, is we got stuff back to people, and that made people smile. And that's kind of what we're all in it for. Sure, is to help the, the public. And then, well, you know, when we start chasing robbers around, they they might kill you. Mm-hmm. So you had to go a little bit slower and a little bit. Uh, and then when we started chasing killers, then a lot they will different. kill you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole game's different. So uh, that, that's kind of in a nutshell how I ended up the. To be on your show i think well let me ask you this question you said that you were in undercover for 10 years then you 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 alluded to it with quite a bit of sarcasm you got kicked out uh what kind of stuff did you do in undercover it's really kind of the same thing I, everybody wants to say well you grow the beard and, and you get in there and you find some big motorcycle gang and, and you start doing heroin and all that kind of stuff it's the sa- exact same work that we do in burglary or, or homicide you know you build cases we we don't go inside because i'm not a doper right i don't i you know i'd be spotted a mile away going in there some heroin den there just so well, who's the cop right so so you work outside there and, and you learn how to talk to people you learn how to develop informants you learn how to write papers uh, search warrants uh, wiretaps anything you need to do to to get those organizations down uh, and, but in the same regard, I, I like the, the undercover work because you didn't have to shower. Right. <laughs> you didn't have to shave. You didn't have to do all these things. You just roll out of bed and go to work. And, and it was fun work, really, basically. But uh, in this business, we know when we're in the right spot. And I wasn't in the right spot there. So, uh, uh, like I said, internal affairs was, was a joke. But you know, I, I wasn't in the right spot there. It wasn't until I got to the investigation side that I hit my stride. And uh, uh, Sean, you you know where you're in the right spot, and and, and I just enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, Dave, but my maybe my third year on, I did patrol two years, footbeat for a year. Then they got rid of footbeat, and uh, Tim Bracken 
and Gene Watkins were my supervisors in Footbeat. When they got rid of it, they both went to major crimes, third shift. Bracken took me with four years on into major crimes. So when you say you're the right spot or wrong spot, I found out in about 90 days that was the wrong spot for Sean Larkin. So our, our major crimes is called our major crimes homicide unit. And you do, you respond to every unnatural death, um, but you process the scene and you get to go, uh, you know, do the fingerprints. I, like I've talked about on here before to the, on the, to the, on the, on the bodies after they've had the, you know, the autopsy done and stuff like that. So you do get assigned cases to work. They're, they're not great cases to work. They're pretty shitty because the homicide detectives take the good ones. Um, um, as you know, they should. <laughs> you know, and now we've got other units that work more shootings than, than what homicide used to have to work almost all of them. But um, so, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about when you go somewhere that is not the spot for you. That I, I, Early in my career, I found one of those. I understand that, and really, uh, I like to talk when I talk about homicide detectives going to crime scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, we destroy the heck out of those scenes uh, because we just everybody wants to go see the body. Yep. Uh, and, and all we're doing is walking over the evidence. So you see the, the major crimes, the crime scene guys looking at us like, well, you know, why in the heck do you have to go that close? That body's not going to tell you much. Right. right. So you know, we step on shell casings and, and that sort of thing. There's no reason for us to be there, but yet. We do. No, I, I will say this. Going in that early in my career, when I did come back out into patrol afterwards, and then I promoted just a few years later, it definitely helped me as far as being a better field officer, a better you know supervisor managing other officers that are on crime scenes because I knew what to look for, what to do there. And it, it, a crime scene guy, man, has a lot of power because I'm talking like the chief of police shows up or anybody shows up, and, and it's a – their crime scene, so to speak, because they're the one working it. And so they were like, no, you can't come in here. I mean, they, they literally get to tell people, hey, you can't come in here. If you do, you've got to sign this log. So you kind of get a little bit of pull. You can dog cuss them if they get too close to your stuff, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Might happen. <laughs> There's a thing about ICU nurses. ICU nurses pretty much don't take shit off of anybody. You could be a world-class surgeon. You come in and tell an ICU nurse, and she's going, get the fuck out of my room. I'll be out in a second. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of the way it sounds like. Yeah. That's Jason here in the podcast. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so so we've alluded to these uh, crime scenes and stuff. Kind of, Can you kind of explain how a crime scene works? What You get a call. How do you work that kind of stuff? Well, that's it. That's really a, a neat question to ask and doesn't get asked very often from, from you know, the public wants to know how you catch them. Uh, but from the, the point of view where the, the phone call comes in, let's say 3 o'clock in the morning, you, you get used to that phone call. Uh, here it comes. You, you, really, all I needed to know was somebody's dead, uh, whether the scene was, was big and I needed a lot of people or it's just relatively contained and, and I just need the, the next people up to come on in. And uh, you know, usually two or three detectives will get called. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, the homicide is – uh, the mayor wants to know and the chief of police wants to know and the uh, your major your captain uh, the deputy chief everybody wants to know these things and, and that's a phone call so <laughs> mm -hmm. that's a pain in the butt when you, so you when don't you have like a role. phone tree where you just call the mayor and the mayor calls like two yeah, other hey, people and they call two other people like the pta snow day or something <laughs> Once I figured out how to work that group text, uh, it yeah, was, it, it worked a lot, a lot better. Right? So everybody got, and then there's a, a paper trail, you know. The, so uh, they couldn't tell me I didn't call them. Yeah, and yeah. They go back to sleep and don't notify the mayor or whoever wants to get notified. But from there, it, it's kind of uh, it's interesting because my wife would wake up and then she wants to get in the way because she wants to help. You know, she she immediately wants to have these questions like, "What happened?" and "What are you chasing?" And it's like you you know. Man, that's what the rookie cops on the street want to know. Right. Uh, so I don't know anything. And, and she eventually learned after a couple, three years that she'd just roll over and go back to bed and uh, get out of the way, basically. So from there, you, you roll to the scene. And, and like I said, the, I like to say the dumb look on our faces, if you'll see it on the first 48, is not an act. We don't know what the heck we've got when we get there. You know, you usually see a body, obviously. Uh, sometimes uh, the ambulance has already rolled it away, so you don't even see that. You, you, you know, you just get you get briefed, and, and you go from there. You take a look at it. You get the if there's cell phones there, that's great. You, you grab those. You find out who the dead person is, and, and uh, if it's a gangster, we, we'd call Sean Larkin and say, hey, "Sean, wake up. Uh, who is this guy?" <laughs> and uh, and that's the way it really works. I mean, it, it's like a a I like to say baseball because I like baseball, but it's really your baseball team is uh, everybody's involved. 
everybody has a little job to do at, at some point and it doesn't really matter what that is i mean we you know we, we pit, baseball teams have pitchers 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 have egos homicide guys have the same thing but but really what, once we're on scene uh, everybody chips in to do whatever we got to do if that's walking down a ditch uh, uh, you know somebody will do it so, so so whenever you go to these crime scenes, I mean, it's kind of glamorized and, of course, popular culture that you'll go, you'll do your initial investigation, then they'll have it taped off for three to four months, and then you'll be able to return there, and you'll be able to look at it again with fresh eyes and do that. I assume it's not like that. You get, gather all your information at the beginning? Right. I mean, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> If there's a homicide whisperer out there, then, then by golly, they're a lot better than we are. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, we go there, we, we get what we got, and, and then if there's cameras up, we'll, we'll go back and do it. But we don't go back and, and visit that scene like you see on TV. Uh, heck, we, we usually have three or more murders by that by that time. So, uh, no, you better get everything you got while you're there, or there's a good chance you're not going to get it. And Which that makes it difficult at night when it's dark and you, you don't know actually what you're looking for, right? And <laughs> you mean you're kind of shining flashlights to look around to see stuff? Well, we do stay out there probably till the daylight. Okay, so see, there. okay, but, that's somebody you know, in there. It's just not two, three months later. Uh, right. You got to see it in the daytime too. I mean, because you can't miss something, and that's uh, you know, if we don't have a gun and it's laying there, we really don't want the citizen to call in later saying, "Hey, we got your gun." <laughs> kind of makes us look bad on that TV show. Yeah, <laughs> that, that episode didn't make it to air. <laughs> Man, Dave, how long were you in a homicide? Seven years. So you were in seven years as a supervisor the whole time. Um, Tulsa averages, what would you guess, number of murders a year? I mean, sixty would be probably. That's probably I say it's look at. Pro- yeah, I mean, we've had some lows in the low in the forties, which is like a crazy low year for us. And I know we've hit. What was the highest number you were in? I think we had eighty-two here last year, but that wasn't under you. Well, eighty-two in two thousand sixteen was a record year. Okay, and then we beat that the next year, eighty-three. Okay, well there you go. So, you you've been to a lot of murders. Um, one thing you were known for on this department is no matter when the murder happened, where it happened, you came in. And like you said, the detectives are kind of on a rotational basis, depending on the number of bodies that are needed for it, how many guys come in. But you went to, uh, as far as I know, damn near every one of these. In your seven years, on an average of 60 a year, we're talking on average 420, how many do you think you did not make it out to? The only ones I did not make it out to were the ones uh, where I was out of town. Yeah. And then I'm on the computer working those. So uh, somebody, in my opinion, the way I ran it, is there has to be one person to know everything about what's going on. Not everything, but something about that case. Because if you you bump into one that's going to be related to another murder, and then quickly we've got a spree killing going on, and you know how the gangsters work. Mm -hmm. uh, You know, we've got to get on top of that in a hurry. So the ones that are really assigned to one case are focused on that one case. Uh, there has to be somebody sitting on the outside like an umbrella saying, well, this piece here fits to this murder here. And, and the way I worked is all of that came, and I put all that together on, on what we call the tip sheet, and we sent it out to you all so that the, the patrol officers had everything we had. Uh, no secrets in our business because I don't care if you solved it. Howard, you could tell him, Jason, if you wanted to solve one, knock yourself out. Uh, we'd let the public solve it if they could. You know, we don't want you chasing down the killer, but but by golly. Uh, you might end up with a nickname like Sticks. <laughs> no, that was, you know, that was one of the things, and I don't know whether it be technology or different leadership in there type of deal, but um, I, I, I know for a fact with Dave in there, if there was a homicide that happened 2 in the morning, and just say we didn't get called on it. It wasn't a gang-related deal, but it was a, a – you know, a homicide. We come into work, whether it be eight o'clock, ten o'clock in the morning. There was a tip sheet sent out, and it was like a mass email. Sometimes it went out to the whole department, but a lot of times it went out to at least a, a large number of, um, I don't know how it worded. You know, staff, investigators on the department, people like that. And it was like, hey, this is what happened last night. Here's our victim. You know, here's our potential suspect. There was nothing kept from everybody. I mean, it it it, it definitely was put out there to everybody. And, I, and again, I think that's a good reason why here in Tulsa we do have that high solve rate, one of the, the, the several different reasons. Well, you're basically having a murder every six days in Tulsa is what it sounded like. You're doing approximately 60 a year, right? So um, during that time, you also alluded to the fact that you had, um, sometimes you would have murders that were connected, whether they be revenge, same shooter, that kind of stuff. 
How long did it, what was your normal average to solve one of these cases? I mean, they're coming down the pike. Every six days, you're getting a new one. Well, I think we, you know, you, you talk about that. We had eight and eight days in 2013, so that, that puts you behind the eight ball pretty quick. Right. Uh, we solved every one of those in January that year. I think there was 20. So Dang. <laughs> we had a lot. Um, you know, it, it's just, uh, gosh, you, you work one till it's done, and then you, you move on. The, the average solve rate, they're, they're really, it's hard to say uh, when it breaks. You just keep working it until you, you get there. Uh, if uh, the ones that are really difficult to, to solve are the ones we don't know why they occurred, uh, if, I always say if you don't know the why, it's really tough to get to the who. But once you figure out the why somebody's laying there dead, then uh, the who is somewhere in the shadows. And Pretty easy to find, then, huh? It's not, that, it's not really all that difficult. And that's why, you know, that's the big mystery, I think. Uh, people say, wow, how do you solve uh, 95% of them? Well, a lot of these <laughs> these victims didn't plan to be victims, and a lot of these killers didn't plan to be killers. So uh, they carried a lot of things around with them that, and dropped a lot of things at the scene. Uh, and it just really is a matter of going to work and getting into that heroin den, so to speak, and getting dirty with them. Uh, well, that, that's my business. Well, with the uh, you allude to the ninety-five percent solve rate, the five percent. What you can't find the why, you can find the who, but. What makes a case unable to be solved? Well, you, you can find the why uh, in most of them. The, the who, I would almost say, are down into the 1% that we have no idea. Right. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, some of that is the victim's family won't talk. Uh, gangs are big in, in uh, witnesses disappearing. Uh, that happens. Uh, we can't say it doesn't. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, well, where they're afraid to come forward. Sure. And rightfully so. We can't say that, that uh, your witness is not targeted, but we got to keep you safe. Um, so, though, and then you get to the DA, some of that is the district attorney just won't file. Right. Uh, I mean, it's not, sometimes you just go over there, and we were talking earlier about uh, Sheriff or Delato can get over there and have a stinky case solved or, you know, get it filed because he, can, he knows the right way to do it. Um, and then I could take over a solid case, and they said, no, Dave, go go do this or something. So the DA not filing it on some of this is aggravating, and I think that's some of that that, that gets with that. But I would say in very few, few do we not know who in the heck they are, and I can name maybe five on my hand that, that we had in my career that, that I know we don't even know who, and, and, and so those are still out there. Yeah, just random acts of violence, huh? Could be random, and it just could be that we're, you know, we're not good enough yet. You know, I want to go back to one of the things you said. When you're talking about, uh, you know, the high solve rate. One of these things being, you know, your victims, your suspects. Victim didn't plan on being a victim. Suspect didn't plan on being a suspect, and they leave things, you know, clues, whatever it may be. Did you work the one at the Walmart where the guy? I think it was the Walmart down here on South Memorial. And it was caught on surveillance. It was a robbery inside of a car. Yes. Okay, man. And, and just just talk about that. When talking about someone leaving something, if it's how I remember, I remember this guy that left. He dropped something, ran from the scene, came back, picked up what he dropped, and ended up dropping something else. Yeah. He. I mean, I. Gosh, I'd have to go back, but I do remember that because it was on video and it right. was a far video, but you could see the uh, the muzzle flash inside a car. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's something you don't really see a lot of, and. It, you know, it's kind of gruesome at the same time because, you know, somebody's dead. Uh, but but then you see him, you know, pinhead running away. He did not plan on being a, a suspect inside that car. You can just tell that. And then uh, here he comes back again, bouncing along. And I don't, you know, I don't know what he left the first time, the second time. I don't know if it was a gun or a wallet or something. But, but he left something where we could just go get it. And it's like, well, this one, it's solved. And we just got to. <laughs> You just yeah. got to put it together. As I say, I remember, and I, I might have it backwards. For some reason, I thought it was like he took off running, left his phone, came back for his phone, but then he dropped his wallet, or vice versa. I mean, it was something that literally was like he left, this is who I am, because he was seen on video running back to pick up whatever else he dropped. So you don't catch the smart ones. No. <laughs> you know, you don't yeah, catch I, the smart he, ones. He's he not good at that crime game. No, nah, he was no good at that crime game. He no. should do something else. 
He is doing something else. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else might be doing him. So, um, anyways. All right, Dave. So, uh, man, let's talk about it. Seven years in there. Um, man, give 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 us, uh, you know, one of these that just kind of – something. one of the ones you're really, really proud of. Not that any of them are any less – uh, meaningful to solve than any others, but something, man, you know, it was a hell of a case that your guys, you, um, you know, had to jump through fire, so to speak, and, and, and solve for somebody. Uh, they're all, and, and, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to sure put anybody down or anything like that, because if you know that when you got a good team, then, then they're all interesting. Uh, I think, uh, the one that I look to is when I talk about you got to be ready day one. Uh, I came in May 31st, 2011. May 31st, 2011, when I was in robbery, I was the robbery sergeant a month before, and we had Billy Joe Hammonds was doing some uh, some home invasions mm -hmm. of, of not-so-nice people, and he was stealing their dope and stealing their guns, and, and we were having a heck of a time. We finally got him identified and got his picture out there to – to the rest of the crowd and then on may 31st at noon we uh, dwight cole comes on the radio officer dwight cole comes on the radio he's, he's taking rounds taking rounds yeah yeah so it's like man that is not a good thing to have happen at the <laughs> lunch hour so we all run down there and he ended up at the walmart and, and uh billy joe hammonds was the suspect we didn't know that at the time but uh he ran out and then shot a Chinese national student that mm -hmm. was at TU trying to steal his car. And unfortunately, the Chinese national student didn't know a big guy with a gun banging on his window meant something. And he took a round in the head and, mm. and died. Uh, the other ones in the pickup truck where he jumped in the back of the pickup truck, mm -hmm. Billy Joe Hammonds did, they unloaded that truck in a hurry. They knew what was going on. And he took that truck. But by that time, there were seven or eight cops in, in a line, and, and it was just – they ended up shooting the heck out of the car. Right. So, so that day one, we've got 800 witnesses at Walmart. Uh, we got Chinese national guy dead. Uh, and an officer involved shooting with eight officers. So you try to corral eight cops after they had something like that happen, and it, it was like, man, this is just – unreal this is the way the thing is going to go then i need to get back to and this office. was your first day as the homicide day supervisor. one day one <laughs> wow so that was uh and you know when you get those so you and you know sean that, that sometimes the chiefs show up at yep. these things and, and every one of them came swinging through there right. trying to give me some sort of direction uh, and i think when, when chief mccrory finally came who i ran with uh, on when we were in patrol, I finally said, man, if you want this, Mark, you got it. Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> well, before you just said that, I was going to say, for, for, to fulfill you in about Dave, Dave doesn't take shit, man. I, I will say that. He will tell whoever get fucked, you know, it doesn't matter who it is. He, he will. I mean, that was part of, I think, why he was successful and everyone that worked for him enjoyed it. But, no, I, I didn't know that was your first day there. And just a little more background on that. This uh, started out as a home invasion outside the city of Tulsa, mm -hmm. took a guy hostage, to show up at another house in Tulsa to get more guns or dope. And the pe somebody es escaped, if I remember correctly, from the other, uh, you know, outside the city, the, the home invasion that happened there, notified police. And that's how Dwight Cole ended up right. over this house as the guy pulls up. Ends up in this uh, pursuit, shots fired deal, goes to the Walmart at 21st and Memorial. The guy jumps out. He's shooting as he runs into Walmart. Then he changed a shirt or take a shirt took off. Took his clothes off. Took yeah. his clothes off, comes out. of them, but yeah. <laughs> Comes out of another door. We would notice a naked guy. Yeah, we'd ca with a gu naked guy with a gun. Are you um, concealing anything? I think he fired shots in Walmart, maybe. Even. He did to yeah. get everybody going out, yep. and yeah. he just snuck out and with him. He snuck out with him, and then did he try to carjack this uh, this Asian kid that was a student here at the University of Tulsa, killed him. Um, yeah, we were at the office at SID at the time, and uh, another guy, Heath Cannon, I remember we jumped in, and we were actually heading north on Yale as he got out to Yale coming south. And uh, I had given him Heath the shotgun, and I had an AR, and we stopped. And I was, uh, we literally said, when he gets down here, we're we're dumping. We're, you know, but ended up getting killed about a half mile before it got to us. And that was a uh, that was a wild one. 
Yeah. I, I had no idea that was your first day in there. Give me, give me some of that stuff you're drinking because that's a hell of a memory, dude. Yeah, you need, you need a bump, man. <laughs> you need a bump. We really did not no. talk about this beforehand. I'm no, impressed. swear, no, man. That. I remember that one. Yeah, and wow. I remember there was an old lady that was in the car nose to nose with him <laughs> when he crashed on the east side of the road, and we were part of it. My group were the ones that went up and got her out of the car with the shield. Yes. Yeah, so I assumed that he was killed. He did. He he, yes, he, he did he, not make it. Yeah, he died inside the truck. Well, kind of leads me to the other part. Whenever you do apprehend somebody that you think is a a murderer, and let's just call them what the hell they are, right? A killer. Um, you interrogate them, right? That's part of your job as well. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I'm not the best interrogator out there, or the best interviewer. Uh, John Brown, who actually grew up with me. I mean, he's we we were together for 25 years. Uh, he wouldn't let me talk to his suspects just because he says you just piss everybody off. <laughs> <laughs> well, t- uh, tell. So whenever you did, have did a, I mention that he'll tell someone to get fucked real quick? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what I've heard is that a lot of people want to tell you what they've done. Yes, uh, that's exactly what happens right from the get go. Really? Uh, these three hour interviews or four hours interviews are just for for the TV show. No, nobody really wants to come in and, and say I did it. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to get to it. And there's a lot of people that do it a lot different. Uh, I particularly say I am who I am. Uh, you get what you get. And once you piss me off, then, then you know, I, I just get angry at some stupid people. And I think that's what you – not that the, my bosses were stupid or anything. But, no. Uh, but the, the, you just didn't have time for bullshit. The killers are, are really kind of – it's just time to, to let everybody know that we know – what you've done. Yes. And it's just, you know, we're, we're not going to hear to, uh, what do they call it? enable you to, <laughs> to carry Waste on. Waste your time. Yes. I mean, that's it. Yeah. We want you to confess and we want you to be, get right with God and all that other kind of neat stuff that we say. But in the end, you did something that is terrible and we know it, you know it, and it's just time to talk about it. Mm-hmm. I will cuss at them, too. Yes. Sorry. I'm sure you will. I mean, I think that kind of comes with the job. But when you have a, when you have a suspect that comes in, and I mean, obviously interrogation has changed since you started, right? I imagine in the 80s there was a little bit of, oh, bam, mm-hmm. <laughs> tell me what you need, right? So, I mean, I imagine those techniques have changed. How, how do you get somebody who just wants to beat around the bush? Let's say, let's use Detective Brown. How, what's his, you were more of the, we would probably call you the bad cop, right? <laughs> and, and and Detective Brown would be the good cop? Well, I, he, he has a temper too. I would say Jason White is probably the, the interviewer, mm-hmm. the, the, the guy that, that we look towards that negotiates a, a confession more than uh, us, let's say, point out the, I always like to say, you know, does this make sense to you? As we're sitting across the table, you, you just tell me something that's really crazy stupid, and, and I'm going to ask you, does that make sense? Um, you know, so you just go from there. You keep putting out inconsistencies. Like to say, they, they haven't really thought this out. Right. And we have seen what we've seen, and we, we've done this enough to know where this interview is going. Um, I think there's only one time where I've asked a, 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 per, a killer, just tell us what happened so we can get on with it and within 10 minutes she's telling me that she killed or shot the guy so uh but that didn't come with that well everything was fine well i have a friend that's a judge and he said and this kind of alludes to some of the physical evidence that you guys collect he said the only way that you'll ever get away with a murder is no motive in a high-powered rifle he goes that's the only way i said the the police will find you i mean if you have any connection to that person if you're anywhere near that crime scene they're going to have physical evidence and they're going to get you. That's really true. I mean, uh, I, that's why people should not kill people. Well, you shouldn't <laughs> kill people for lots of reasons. But, you know, but that, that's very true. I mean, if you keep your mouth shut, then there's a good chance, you know, for no reason. Yeah. But thank God there's not enough of us. There's not very many people like that in the world. But there are. There's true evil out there. I've seen it. Uh, but to get back to your, your question, the video in the interrogation room is is always on when, when a suspect's in the room. Uh, that's just something I put in place so that we wouldn't be able to go back to the 80s and say, you stripped them naked and you beat them. Right. Uh, we can't do that. We don't do that. And nor would we want a false confession. 
Sure. And we don't ever want to put the wrong person in prison. No. That's happened before. Shouldn't happen under my watch. I, I would be real surprised if anybody that is in there uh, didn't do what we alleged. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely, and it is. And there are different policies that are, I mean, they're literally in place. It's not just Dave as a supervisor that says, hey, all you know things need to be recorded. I mean, there are departmental policies that say this has to be done and, you know, two people in the room or whatever it may be. I mean, there's all kinds of, of, of things. And, and it's all from lessons, I guess, you know, of things that have happened through years in law enforcement, not, you know, not necessarily here in Tulsa, just something bad happens in another part of the country, you know, all the departments take notice and, and, and kind of get into it. Discover best practice to work yeah. with, right? So talking about, uh, you know, not to, I guess, divulge back into, you know, any of the homicides, but you said you, you've seen pure evil. Um, what's one that just really a suspect just sticks out to you, you know, somebody that uh, one of the cases you've done? The one that I can bring to mind is I wasn't even in homicide at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I talk about it and when I go kind of around the nation talking to people. I said, when, when cops get tired, uh, that's not a good enough excuse to go home and go to bed. Because if we're in this business, we identified Billy Jean Marshall as a robber that would go into places and hit people in the head with a hammer. Oh. Uh, for no reason, other than that was what he did. And we had s several of those robberies. We, we finally got him identified 5 o'clock at night. Uh, in the evening, we got uh, a warrant issued for his arrest. We looked at, at the robbery guys that were there. We've been at it for a while. And said, what do you want to do? We want to go after him and find him? And they said, well, now we'll, we'll take him down in the morning. That night, Alonzo Tibbs was uh, at a home invasion, got hit in the head with a hammer and died. Mm -hmm. ah. So uh, there's the feeling of, I bet you the Tibbs family wished we didn't go home and go to bed. So right. you're never too tired to save a life. So I remember that. Billy G. Marshall, once we realized it was a hammer attack, we had him in custody in, in, in two hours. So maybe we could have just worked two extra hours and saved a life. Mm. Uh, those things, those things eat at you. I mean, eventually, you know, we're human. Right. And, uh, you know, you can laugh about it, drink about it or whatever. But, but in the end, uh, what we're doing out here is very, very important to a very small amount of people. Mr. Tibbs and his family wish we would have went to work. I know they did. Yeah. Well, you know, and you, you, talking about you only missing the homicides that when you were out of town yet you were still working on them and, and i was going to mention that earlier when you guys come in on one you guys work and work and work and work it's not hey we're going to put our eight hours in today oh four o'clock we go home we're back tomorrow 8 a.m if any type of lead that's popping up any witness that needs to be found anybody that patrol or another detective unit finds and brings into you you, you guys work i mean you guys are what, what's the longest shift you put straight through I mean, I know you've made a lot of damn overtime money, but that's but it's you're not taking advantage of it. It's just that that's the nature yeah. of the beast. Uh, I I think since I'm gone now, I can say I was the longest is 34 straight hours working. Yeah. Uh, I know Chief Larson will cringe when if he ever hears that again because we were supposed to go home at 16. Yeah, 16. Uh, and get like 12 hours of sleep. I don't know what the rule was, but it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right, and it's not just us. I mean, we, we, would, we would lean on the gang unit. If we had a gang lead, we would expect you guys to come in and did it. And we did. And that's why Tulsa is a little bit different. It, it really is a team effort. Our warrant unit was all around Luke Sherman and his group. Matt, yep. Matt uh, I want to say Matt Carpenter, but he's the baseball player. Matt uh, Hart. Matt Hart. Hart, there you go, Matt Hart. And, and that group, and Gene and, and yep. those guys would, would come in, and they'd run, run with us. So uh, it, there's a lot of people out there, 36 hours. It's not just Dave Walker. No, I agree. Doing it, so. Well, uh, what was this case that you had to work so long? What what was going on that kept you engaged? That was a murder of a guy at Rib Crib. The, it was a robbery. Some suspects came in and killed this this, this guy that was closing, basically. Mm -hmm. And we had to run them down. And it was like another one of them silly. It was. Uh, no gangsters. The Rib Crib, yeah. Yep. Uh, 17th and Harvard. Harvard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sean, give me some more of that. Yeah, no. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you a little story about your you suspect like that on juice? that. So, uh, you know, at the Tulsa County Fair, which, uh, you know, here in, at closing. this time of the year, um, but we had that suspect, we had taken a picture of him out at the fair when we had to work at doing gang stuff because all these gangsters would show up and he was walking around in this white hooded sweatshirt 
with a uh, like the airbrush on the back of it that had all his dead homies on it. And we had never seen this kid, and he was dressed out in these Hoover Crip colors. So we uh, we stopped him, photographed him, took pictures. At the time, he was an absolute nobody uh, in our system. And I think it was a year later, he did the rib crib deal. And so we actually, uh, part of our gang instruction I would do for other law enforcement agencies or even public deals, uh, we, we had confiscated that sweatshirt from this kid. And that's what I would talk about is how the progression of somebody who's kind of a nobody in the gang world, we start to document them. And this is the path that they go down, basically. And he ends up being a murder suspect. He was young. I mean, he was 17, yeah, 18, 19, know. something like that when he did that. And it was just an innocent guy that was yeah, killed there at Rib Crib. Yeah. Well, in this day and age, I mean, everybody's on videotape, too. Even if, I mean, everybody's being filmed. I mean, that's part of probably one of the things that you use to solve these crimes. Is like, hey, man, I got you in this hoodie wearing this. This is your stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, the cameras, uh, if we can't get them... You know, on intersections, we need to get families and, and homeowners to, to get to the street and businesses to, to use their coverage on the street because you're right. That's, they don't do it on purpose, but we solve them you know, <laughs> as we see the suspect arrive, and then you see the suspect leave from other people's cameras. Uh, we had one of those where we followed him back, man, almost to my house. Uh, on camera on cameras you know at different intersections uh, and uh, he's he's doing life without parole so did, did, did you work the arby's one at 41st and garnett with the girl the guy that came in and spit on the girl i was already retired for that one all right well that was a camera one this this uh this guy ends up shot at 31st and garnett in his car in a parking lot ironically another walmart parking lot but he ends up dead in his car and they have nothing it's like a whodunit they have no idea why so between 31st and 41st on Garnett, it's nothing but residents, but it's all the backyards that face Garnett. So there's no cameras facing the street. Well, they know he was coming from the south, so down there there's a quick trip at that intersection, and they look and they see his car over at Arby's. So they go into Arby's to talk to, you know, w what happened when he was here. It turns out this guy got mad at a female employee. He spit on her, gets out in his car, and it's on video. She gets in her car, chases him down, and starts dumping rounds at him. <laughs> <laughs> shoots him and kills him in the car he crashes she goes back to work <laughs> and so they have her on video chasing him out of the parking lot and yeah i mean it was a what did she get charged with uh murder yeah. Was, yeah i mean murder it's a murder a second degree i mean she, if i can kill the guy howard that's how it works <laughs> well he spit on her but, she, got, like she got she got burglary i mean what you <laughs> she killed a guy so um i was thinking that like the spitting would like oh we understand oh yeah yes <laughs> yes you spit on he's me i'm gonna chase you down a, on a, you. All right. a mile away and, and kill you no it doesn't work that way Dude, she did not play no she didn't she went back to work but that was a, a, just an example of what he's talking about you might not have camera that shows what happened or, but this thing is a mile away and they were literally able to piece together okay this is where it started from then they go in there and, and you know end up solving this case um, got to ask, we only got a few minutes left here. Do you miss it? You look good. You look like you sleep more now. You know, that's one of the things you kind of joke with. I mean, you, you, you look good, but do you miss it? I, I do miss making that difference. Uh, I do miss that part of it. But it's, like I said, after I woke up and three more years of seeing it, it was time to go. You, it runs on you. Mm -hmm. um, you're right. I've locked, dropped 40 pounds. TV puts 40 pounds no, on you. No, you do. You look good. So, uh, you know, th those donuts in the morning and pizza at 3 a.m., that's not the, the diet that you should have. Uh, but I miss making that difference. Uh, but, you know, murders are going to get happen, and murders are going to get solved. And, and by golly, I, I, I know enough to know that it's there, there's people out there that they can get it done. And, you know, when I die, that it's going to happen. But, you know, if I stayed there much longer, I would have died there. And yeah. And people don't need to do that. No. You know, I actually uh, – recently I was doing a public speaking presentation, and it was to a group of law enforcement, and I was just talking about the job, the nature of the job and what's going on uh, in our profession right now. And I had found a study that said the difference for a male in the civilian world compared to a male in the poli – a career, you know, law enforcement job – it is a 22 year difference in life expectancy because of the stresses, you know, I think that come with this job, diet, lack of sleep, all that type of stuff. And then obviously the mental stress that comes with it. I mean, and that's, you know, that's an entire generation. I mean, you're literally, you're missing out on seeing grandkids or great grandkids. And um, so, yeah, you gotta, when the time is right, 
or when yeah. you know it is, you got to get out. And like you said, you do look you look great. So kudos <laughs> to you, man. I mean, I haven't seen you. I don't I know think if I've you seen look you. Attractive. I've never seen you before <laughs> yeah. today, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen well, you since you retired, nice know, but no, you look wow. good. Well, wow, thank you. It, no. it, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun going back and, and visiting again and, no. and talking about stuff. It's tough, man. It is. You know, it is. Um, you keep in touch with everybody, or I know John and you, like you say, we're well, pretty yeah, tight. We're, but... we're, we're still close. The family's close. The wives are, are together. And uh, no, I don't go back to the office. It's nope. just uh, it's another place uh, that, that that I can avoid. Yeah. No, I'm the, I'm the same way. I mean, I, I periodically have a – a coffee or a breakfast with the guys here and there type of deal but yeah they're they're they got new leadership and they're moving on and doing great they're still solving solving cases and running shit so it, it goes on i yep. always tell everybody man you're an employee number to the city of tulsa as long as you remember that you can go forward yep. well, dave it was a pleasure having you on today we really appreciate it well i mean and this was this was fun yeah it goes fast for too hour. yeah <laughs> easily hey we'll have you back <laughs> All right, Dave. All right. Man, Thank that, you. that does it for this episode of Cocktails and Cocktails. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.